Hello, welcome to New England Authors. We're presenting here the talent of our region here. And I've had so many authors and people talking about music, but I've never had a person who actually composes music. So today, I bring my good friend, Eric Lindgren, and we're gonna be talking about composing. Welcome to the show, Hey, Eric. it's an honor. It's uh, wonderful. Uh, so, uh, yeah, um, first of all, uh, you've composed everything from TV jingles to orchestral pieces, right? Well, uh, the answer is yes. Um, when I was in my formative years, everybody wants a hit song or a hit orchestral piece. And believe it or not, I wanted a hit jingle. Yes. And I know it sounds ironic, and in some ways in the early 80s, I kind of accomplished that. Um, it was a real thrill. I was out uh, knocking on the ad agency doors all around Newbury Street and everything. And then um, I remember I, I ended up knocking on the doors of Grossman's. They were a, a store very much like Home Depot, you yeah. probably remember. Yeah. I think they're still scattered around a little bit. Yeah. And here I'm this kid that, you know, I, I had a few credentials, this and that. I used to write a lot of corporate music for my uh -huh. uh, brother who was a video producer at the time. So I would score a lot of corporate videos and things. So I went into Grossman's with my satchel uh -huh. and uh, bag of tricks. And in 1978, I got the commercial. Uh -huh. and it was outrageous. It was kind of a lousy commercial, but yeah. you know, it was okay, it worked. It was catchy, it was catchy. Yeah. And, and the thing is, it paid the bills, right? Well, I saw that, you know, that was a viable way to make a living as a composer. Um, when I got out of graduate school in 1977 from University of Iowa, um, I didn't really want to recycle back into academia. Um, I thought that was a very, you know, a lot of the peers of mine did go into uh, teaching, teaching yeah. college and uh -huh. uh, high school, and I think that's a wonderful profession, but it just wasn't for me. So I just started knocking on the doors and eventually ended up getting uh, a fair amount of uh, credentials. So uh, so you studied composition or in, in, in school? I started playing piano, um, I think when I was probably four or five, that's when I, I took mm. the piano lessons. Mm -hmm. The teacher would come to our house. My older brother and my younger brother also took lessons, but I'm the one that really stuck with it. And uh, then I just uh, really was, was a classical pianist, and I think probably around, uh, ooh, would have been when I was 11 or 12, I really started seeing the light about composition. Mm -hmm. So I was, I was working with pop songs. I was working with, you know, very simplistic, derivative uh, uh, musical ideas. A big influence in my life was Eric Satie, who uh -huh. uh, yeah. I think in 10th grade I had read two biographies of his. Uh -huh. And even though many people consider him a minor composer, to me he's a major composer. Yes. And I just loved his message. Yeah, there's a certain simplicity to his music, isn't there? It's very clear. It's very uh -huh. clear and very conceptually avant-garde. Mm -hmm. um, he, he has many, many phases. And I really uh, liked, you know, along with the, the pieces like the gymnopedes, which were very, very popular and still are. I think they're used for a dog food commercial or something now, or a cat food <laughs> commercial. He would probably love that. Yeah. Um, but uh, I loved a lot of his later works. Yeah. Uh, he did Parade Ballet, which was a surrealistic, kind of Dadaistic uh, ballet that he worked on with Diaghilev and... Uh, Picasso, and he was working in that, that but, circle. Uh, yeah, besides Satie, who are some of the other people who influenced you? A lot of the French uh, composers. Uh, Debussy, I used to play a lot of his preludes in mm -hmm. uh, college and high school. Um, I love Ravel. In fact, the more that I, I listen to Ravel, the more I'm astonished at the breadth that he has. I'm currently working on uh, one of Gabriel Faré's uh, piano nocturnes, which uh, they're, they're challenging pieces, but I'm hoping to get number four. So I really kind of sided more with the French school as opposed to the Germanic school. Yeah, so, so we're talking with Eric Lindgren and uh, we're talking about composing. So uh, have I got this right here? There are kind of two major type of composers, people who sit like you behind the piano and the singer-songwriters with a guitar. Um, is, that, is that my... A uh, simplistic <laughs> notion of composing? Um, there's, I would consider it more like, uh, you know, the, the singer-songwriter is very valid. I mean, I've, I've even done a little of that myself many, 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 many years ago. 
Um, but that's, it's, it's more of a simple form where it kind of comes from the heart. Um, a lot of my music is conceived more conceptually and then I flush it out. Um, I'm kind of of the old school where I still use a pencil and paper and notebooks and then I transcribe it into musical notation. But uh, I'm, I'm much more, I like the architecture of music where it's, to me, it's, it's really a piece of architecture which has, is grounded, it's got a foundation, it has melodic content. Um, the three elements of music are counterpoint, which is sort of the linear, mm -hmm. the harmony, which you can kind of think of as chords, that's vertical, yeah. and then the percussive element. Mm -hmm. So I really see it as a, a very interesting architectural blend of those three elements. Mm. So uh, is it like writing a book is it, uh, what's, what's the... <laughs> what, are you an author? <laughs> <laughs> is it like, what's the difference between writing a, a musical piece and writing a book? Are you writing ideas? Are you writing, what, what are you writing? What? Uh, composition, yeah. it's, I think as an author, you tell me if I'm wrong, but I think it's a lot of hours behind closed doors and then voila, you've got your book. You know, mm. you edit it, you have some feedback. You probably have feedback from writer's groups right. or other people have yeah. writer's groups. Um, composition with what I'm doing, it's much more of a, a social event, mm -hmm. if you want to think of it that way. Yes, I mean, there's a lot of behind closed doors um, uh, uh, work. And it's work, just like writing is, is a work, like uh, you know, writing an orchestral piece. You know, you pretty much sign yourself out for a whole year if you're going to do something like that. Um, but it's, you know, first you come up with the creative concept, then you think about the instrumentation. This is how I conceive yeah. composition. Yeah. Then you, there's the hard work of com com composing. And there's a lot of play in composition. You know, people think, oh, there must be some frame of mind you have to get into. Well, when I was writing jingles, I was basically a turn on, turn off composer. And you just kind of had to do that when you had to produce and meet these uh -huh. deadlines. Yeah. Um, but then, once you come up with this composition, uh, I will input it into the computer. And let's say I'm doing, I do a lot of chamber music for woodwind trios and quartets and stuff. So, um, you know, the software I have, I can actually program the computer so you can sort of synthesize and hear how it sounds. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if Beethoven or Mozart or Rachmaninoff, you know, any of the composers had this yes. software. They would, they would have used have, it. They would have used it. They would have used it, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Because you get to hear what you're doing. And, you know, the obvious thing is, you know, you write something for an oboe and you write it in the wrong range. I mean, you should know as a composer what the range of an oboe is. Mm -hmm. But here with software, you can actually, uh, you know, remedy any of those uh, problems. But, you know, you hear what it sounds like through uh, MIDI or through a computer, through sound modules. But then the next step is a real creative process for me, too. It's um, since I write chamber music primarily that's when you get to collaborate with musicians. And to me, that's when the magic happens. Mm -hmm. You know, you give them the score, you know, they don't always necessarily know all the hard work and the backstory that went on. Yeah. But you pass the parts out. If I write something that is piano and I'm playing piano, I always try to be well-practiced. And then there's that first time you run through it and it's just a collaborative effort. And it's, it's just magic. I mean, it's, you get a real high from it. And then, you know, of course, once you have a reading of it, if you have performances, that's a whole nother element. Then you bring it to the public. And uh, it's but, a but before that, you edit. Do you, um, excuse me, edit would be for, <laughs> for writers. You I would, know. <laughs> you, you would, you would, um, you would change it, right? After a performance, you would, or says some, so the, the violinist says, hey, you know, this part uh, should be like this, or do you change it? Uh, yes, I will. I, I, I mean, the musicians I work with, I mean, I think it's a real honor. And uh, certainly I do take their input. Um, I remember I wrote a, uh, for a big orchestral piece, I wrote a harp part. And I had read Walter Piston's book, like every composer, on orchestration. And in theory, I kind of knew how to write for the harp. But then, you know, I wanted to run this by... Uh, Eva Zordovich, who's a wonderful harpist here in town. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm happy to say after a two-hour 
consultation with her, she said, you know, this is really well written, but I tweak a few things here. Oh, interesting, so, um, interesting, yeah. There is a revision element to it, um, but a lot of times the revision is sort of taken care of when you do the MIDI, the electronic realization. So you really have an idea what it sounds like going into it. Right, you talked to me, uh, you told me in the, in the past that there was a point where you realize that music is no longer instruments, that it's electronic. And that was a real change in your life, right? Can you talk about that? Well, you know, with the decades, I turned 65 this year. Um, but, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of changes happen. When I started producing uh, commercial music, 78, 79, 80, and pretty much through the, uh, the 80s, although things were changing, um, I was one of the I wouldn't say one of the last strongholds of acoustic instruments, but um, you know, I was hiring drummers and I was hiring string players. And at that point there was a big transition because uh, composers, you know, due to budgets, when you're doing commercial music, um, you were sort of required to stick within a budget and the budgets kept going down and down, have to kind of buy into the electronic process. So I found myself sequencing drums, which is the first instrument to kind of go. Uh -huh. And then they go, well, do you think you can cut the budget, you know, yeah, and can yeah. you, uh, you know, maybe just do a string synthesizer and, oh, we don't really need that, you know, that clarinet. Why don't you synthesize that? Uh, your heart, your heart now is in uh, is in something else. Uh, uh, I traveled to uh, Atlanta to see mm -hmm. uh, the the composition you you that uh, was debuted there um, uh, called uh, Extreme Spirituals. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of what what inspired that. Well. I'm not what you would really say a religious person or even a spiritual person for that. Mm -hmm. uh, with that said, um, I have a very good friend. Uh, he's he's um, one of the foremost authorities on African American spirituals. His name is Oral Moses, and uh, I befriended him in Cambridge, uh, I think in the early 80s. Mm -hmm. And we just went to concerts together. We, we just really became good pals. And then in the late 80s, I realized here's this person who is pretty much world class, and he doesn't have any recordings out. So he's all through a, the he's 80s, a, a he's, baritone. he's a bass baritone, a yeah. vocalist. Yeah. You know. And uh, I just said, Oral, you know, someone of your stature, you really need to get recordings because mm -hmm. we need to preserve your legacy. So uh, I think in the late 90s, um, he, he um, got together material for his first CD, which I produced. And since then, we've produced uh, six CDs together, kind of on his turf. Yeah. You know, where it's art songs and African-American spirituals uh, using Harry T. Burley or Hall Johnson or Uzi Brown arrangements, which uh, there's a certain tradition to it that these composers took these marvelous melodies that are kind of timeless yeah. and they added their own arrangements. But, you know, it's, it's, you hear a spiritual with a, a standard arrangement, you go, okay, I kind of get it. But what I wanted to do is um, kind of blow the blow the roof off, you know. Yeah, yeah. Do something really extreme. So I think in uh, the early 2000s, I got a grant from the American Composers Forum, and it was to do unorthodox arrangements of African American spirituals, and we had seed money to do three of them. Yeah. And uh, what I did is I took three spirituals. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Right. Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. Listen to the angel shouting. Uh -huh. That was yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So um, basically, I did arrangements that had nothing to do with tradition. Yeah. In fact, Joshua fit the Battle of Jericho. I think has has more to do with kind of a, a dance disco beat. Oh and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. It has boom, 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 da -da, boom, boom. It's, it's played by a big orchestra. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. heard it was it the uh, the Georgia. It was the Georgia. Yeah. Uh, the Georgia Symphony, Symphony Orchestra. orchestra yeah. yeah. That was back in I think 2014. Yeah.
So I did these arrangements and then I had Oral come up and uh, I run a recording studio. So I had a click track and I had him sing these spirituals and I sort of gave him the key. You know, I think I just played some chords. He didn't listen to the arrangement. I just kind of had chords and I said, all right, sing to these, uh, you know, background arrangements. Yeah. So he sang them and then I kind of cut and pasted his vocal on top of the unorthodox arrangements that I did. Yeah. And I had no idea what his um, reaction was going to be. Yeah. In fact, um, when you're recording and you overdub things, a lot of times you use a click track, which is a metronome. Yeah. So, you know, that way everything's in sync. You, uh -huh. know, you have a bass player to it and you add a keyboard to it and everything kind of has a click. So I had Oral listening to the chord progressions with a click in his mm -hmm. headphones as he sang these spirituals a cappella. Yeah. And I thought, oh, what am I doing? Here I am, I'm telling him what to do. Yeah. You know, it's like, oh, is this wrong or what? So after he did them, it was like, well, how did you feel, Oral? You know, did you feel constrained by this click? Yeah. And he goes, Eric, I loved it. It brought me right back to the church. I'm uh -huh. rolling, I'm <laughs> rolling. So yeah. I thought we were off to a good start. Yeah, those, uh, those spirituals had a uh, hidden message to them, right? Well, were... spirituals do. They have this thing uh, Oral refers to as code. Mm -hmm. And uh, the one, one of the ones that I like to refer to it is uh, in, you cross over into Jordan. Yeah. You know, or as Oral says, cross over into Jordan. There's, there's a yeah. pronunciation that he uh -huh. uses. And basically that's escaping. And yeah. it was code for other slaves who would be singing the song. Yeah. And it would mean, we're going to escape. Uh, wade so in they, the water. Yeah, wade in the know, water yeah. and all this, you know, it's all code. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're, they're just, the more I got into spirituals, maybe I did become a spiritual person at the time. Uh -huh. It really had a, a moving effect on me. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. Was a, it's very moving to, to hear. So uh, um, tell us a little about uh, crossover music. Crossover classical music, mm -hmm. what's, what's that? Well, I'd like to call myself a crossover, classical crossover composer. And that to me designates that you're mixing two disparate elements. And to me, that's when things get interesting. Mm -hmm. It's when you mix these two aspects. Right. For instance, with Oral, you know, he, he sang traditional spirituals. And here I am coming up with these these arrangements that have nothing to do with the past. They're yeah. sort of out of the blue. And uh, interestingly, the extreme spirituals, the, uh, the first evolution of it was the arrangements were done with my um, musical ensemble of 35 plus years. I've been with a crossover a classical rock group where essentially our music has been described as the world's hardest rocking chamber music quartet. And the group that I've been with uh, since 1980, it's called Bird Songs of the Mesozoic. Mm -hmm. And we used to play Cambridge all the time. We used to do tons of tours, lots of recording. All over New England. Well, all over yeah. the world. All yeah. over the world, huh? Yeah, every spring we would kind of go down south all through the 80s and 90s. And we've played in Portugal. Uh, we've gone to California. We've actually played the Honolulu Academy of the Arts three times in the uh -huh. 80s and 90s. Um, but essentially... Um, this group where we, don't, we, we, we would play in rock clubs. Mm -hmm. Like we used to play jacks for some of the old veterans that remember that uh -huh. right on Mass Ave. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we just played all these rock clubs. Uh, we played Danceteria in New York, uh, you know, on and on and on. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, we were in the rock world and yet we were basically doing high octane punky classical music. Yeah. And uh, I remember whenever we would do these tours, we would have these opening groups who, you know, they might have heard about us. I mean, we, we had a lot of um, visibility at the time. But basically after our set, I remember these, these groups, sometimes they'd be a hardcore group, sometimes they might be a folk rock group, some, they might be a psychedelic group, you know, nobody really knew how to uh, pair us up. But I remember members would come up to us at the end of the night and they just kind of shake their head and go, well, you guys aren't from around here, are you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know where we're from, but, you know. 
Yeah, yeah. so, so um, uh, all your comp compositions, by the way, this is our New England authors. Uh, we've, I've talked uh, with a lot of uh, people who've written about music, but I've never actually talked with someone who has uh, written music himself, and mm. Eric Lindgren is a composer. So uh, the, the, well, afterwards, you have to generate uh, this in a computer form, right? Well, again, the creative process is I write paper and pencil in traditional spiral bound, uh -huh. you know, 10 by 12 Not, not many people do that anymore, right? Uh, I'm really not sure what people do anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think every composer kind of goes to the beat of a different drummer. They right, really okay. do. And, and everyone just has their own method. And mm. then, then you have to put it into a, a MIDI or you have to put it into... Yeah, I have musical software and just like you know, Coke and Pepsi, kind of that, or McDonald's and Burger King, you have in musical software, you have Finale and you have Sibelius. And I tend to align myself with the same Sibelius. It's a little easier for me to use. Mm. But basically, Those are it's, the two, um, two softwares. it's the two music yeah. programs. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So I kind of will input it in there. And that's also a real creative process because uh, um, very often composers nowadays and younger composers, I'm kind of generalizing, but just with computer technology, you have this cut and paste technology. Right. And being of an kind of an older school, I love to write things that I refer to as through composed, where it starts and it ends, and it doesn't really have this cut paste technique to it. Um, so that it, it evolves and I may bring back a musical idea or I may restate an idea mm. or I might even use sonata form, you know, which has, you know, the, uh, the development, the recapitulation along with the statement. But every time it comes back uh, in through composition, it's kind of transformed, Yeah, you know. You could you could make it a third higher or, or do yeah. anything you want with it. Yeah, right? I mean you and can you can transpose it. Uh, you can you know do all sorts of different compositional techniques. But uh, you know I might cut and paste a melody. You know if I if I use a melodic thing. But uh, I always try to to have it evolve because I never like static things just repeating. So tell me, uh, where is uh, music uh, the music business? You you're part of the music business as oh, yeah. well, yeah. Where is, oh, yeah. Where, is it at, uh, where is it at today? I mean, uh, I don't remember, well, I buy CDs when I go to a concert or something just to support the artist, but, but you know, we don't buy CDs anymore. We listen, to, uh, we listen off the web. Um, how do musicians get paid? Uh, is, are you shaking your head? This is a, 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 grim, a grim topic, right? I remember we went to uh, MIT uh, a yeah. couple months ago and we saw a composition by Elaine Ruhr, right. a wonderful composer yeah. here. And both of us shelled out $20 and bought the CD at the end of the night. Yeah. You know, that's the way music used to be, yeah. you know, where you would support the musician. And when Bird Songs would do all these tours, we would refer to that as gas money mm -hmm. so we could get to our next gig. Um, but it's... The, the music industry, it's kind of in shambles at this point. It, the old ways just don't work anymore. Uh, you're right, I mean, there's been a kind of resurgence of vinyl, but that, you know, it's a pittance of what, uh, you know, like Dark Side of the Moon, I mean, how many millions and millions and millions of copies did that sell? And now I think if an artist breaks a million copies, they're, you know, they're extraordinary. Um, you know, downloading, I remember when Napster sort of came on maybe 15 yeah. years ago, I mean, everyone was just, they yeah. thought it was diabolical. Like, yeah. here we are ripping it off. And yet I could go to my laptop right now, pop up YouTube, and I could yeah. probably hear 98% of the, the music that oh, I wanted absolutely. to hear. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. You know? um, so that it really brings up this question, what is it worth? Mm. And uh, I mean, I would think the same with publishers. You. You know, people download to your Kindle, and it's right. a fraction of the cost. Yeah. Now, granted, you don't have to make a physical thing, send it off, and you know that's all expensive. But yeah. it's probably very similar. Well, in, in terms of Kindle, uh, they, uh, everybody thought that there was going to be just like the music business, and, uh, yeah. and, but it hasn't. Uh, people hmm. like books. 
but <laughs> <laughs> but uh, people like um, um, to listen to things. People don't buy CDs anymore. Or very very few. Just uh, just uh, just uh, I know I know <laughs> you have I know you have one of the biggest vinyl collections. Uh, we're 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 coming to the end here. Hey. Can you uh, can you just leave us with some some good ideas about uh, music and composing that that you have? Well. I had gone to Tufts University as an undergraduate, and I had made the acquaintance with uh, Dr. T.J. Anderson, who was a huge influence in my life. And it's funny because uh, I remember T.J. said one word of wisdom to me, well, one of many that I remember, but uh, he said to me, quote unquote, three words, know your ancestors. Uh. And to me, that's very, very important because you kind of have to know where you're coming from. And it's funny, after you know, decades, I'm still very, very influenced by French music and Eric Satie. Yeah. Um, I loved, as a kid, I loved wild psychedelic rock. And guess what? I still love wild psychedelic rock. <laughs> and I know my ancestors, so uh, I acknowledge them. Know your ancestors. Oh, yeah. that's great. Eric Lindgren, hey. this is uh, New England Authors. Uh, we're recording here in Cambridge, New England Authors and Composers. And <laughs> We're, we're, we're here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We broadcast on stations around uh, New England. Uh, Eric's a credit to, to the whole region. Uh, remember, watch locally. Thank you. Mm -hmm.